Let us flash back to the mid-90s, where PC gaming was starting to establish itself as a dominant home gaming experience. PC hardware was getting faster and cheaper, so naturally more and more families were able to afford one. It also wouldn't be too long before they were dialing into something called the Information Superhighway. Whatever that was. Microsoft would also release their groundbreaking operating system, Macintosh 84, I mean Windows 95. This sold so crazily due to its ad campaign that there were reports that people bought it without even owning a computer. During this time was the peak of the point-to-click adventure games genre, with both LucasArts and Sierra producing some of the best games in their catalogs. However, we almost lost the publishing powerhouse Marvel Comics, despite the raging success of their animation departments and insane sales during the speculator boom. This was mostly due to a series of terrible business decisions and a sales slump due to some terrible editorial decisions. Never mind the trend in comics known as the Dark Age, which resulted in many gritty reboots and Rob Liefeld's career. He's got the biggest shoulder pads ever existed. It's like I this, figured he would. Chest. So what do these things have in common? Welcome to Does Whatever is Spider Can, where we take a look back at the webhead's long and varied gaming career and find out just how much they replicate Spidey's signature powers. Spider-Man The Sinister Six was published by Byron Prius Multimedia Company and developed by Brooklyn Multimedia, and was released exclusively for Windows 95 and 3.1 operating systems in 1996. With the booming PC market, it was almost inevitable we'd get a Spider-Man game exclusive for the format. It would seem like a pretty bold choice to create a point-and-click action adventure based on the webhead, but let's not forget we already had the notorious text-based adventure. However, as this is the only example I know of Spidey being used in this genre, well, it just goes to show you how well it ultimately turned out. So anyway, we start the game with MJ trying to defuse a bomb in the most glamorous business suit a bomb technician would ever wear. Come on, you can do it, MJ. Come on. We cut to Spidey, swinging in an valiant attempt to get there. I can't let Mary Jane down. She's counting on me. Just in time for MJ to be chewed out by the director. Cut! Cut! Cut, Mary Jane! Come on! No way! Not enough suspense! We'll try this scene again later when you remember how to act! This is of course a fake out, because we all know that in this timeline, Mary Jane Watson Parker is a soap opera actress. So naturally she's trying to make her Hollywood debut. You wanted to be in movies your whole life, and now you've got your big break. Don't let some Hollywood jerk rain on your parade. Unfortunately, things don't seem to be going that well, at least in regards to director Chip Alvarez. However, we soon learn that he's been a dick to, well, everybody. Look, don't you think your crew might respond better to you if you quit insulting them? My crew responds just fine, if they want to get paid, that is. After Chip's hissy fit, he moves the production onto the roof for the big stunt. For reasons. To the roof, people! Time is money! Come on, Tiger. Walk me to the roof. As sirens start blurring in the distance, something happens on set to trigger Peter's spidey sense. And this is the start of the game's multi-path structure. What I mean is you can click on one of two options, which doesn't ultimately matter because both choices reconverge afterwards with no apparent consequences. It appears that these choices typically turn out to be that the top one is a puzzle-related sequence and the other being an action-related sequence. So if you decide to follow the sirens, you end up at Shocker robbing a bank and holding people hostage. After talking to the cops, you head behind the bank where you need to solve a puzzle to knock out the protection grid over the door and take Shocker out. Hmm, Shocker's powers don't usually work this way. He must have rigged up some kind of machine to create that seismic barrier that's blocking the door. This involves webbing the wrecking ball over to the device, then smashing it to pieces. Once you do this, however, you get disorientated by a green mist as it teleports you to the front of the bank for some reason. How did I get here? Great working with you, wall crawler. Thanks to you, I'm an instant millionaire. You got away. You let Shaka escape with the cash. How you let him wall out of there with all that money? With the other choice, you stay on the set as you proceed to watch as the stuntman is halfway through performing the stunt, apparently without his safety equipment or his safety net. Help me! Please! I wasn't hooked to the safety line! Who yelled action? I wasn't ready for the shot yet! The safety net's not ready! I heard you yell action! Help me! 
We weren't ready yet. What are you doing? This despite it being clearly attached in the previous wide shot. The stuntman is literally hanging on for his life. So Peter goes to change to Spidey and suddenly appears several buildings away. Okay. Spidey is then enveloped by a green mist and is confronted by Mysterio, who starts throwing bombs at him, which he must web to destroy. Whilst you're doing this, it appears to the crew that Spider-Man just sat around and did nothing whilst they saved the stuntman. And naturally, Chip throws another hissy fit. This so-called hero, Spider-Man, trespassed on my set. The disturbance nearly caused a member of my crew to plunge to his death. The plot lines reconverge at Peter and MJ's apartment as they're watching the news. This is where we find out about the election for the mayor of New York, and that Canada Bob Mason has a real hate on for Spidey. This city is sinking further and further into an abyss of lawlessness and crime. Gangs intimidate and threaten the innocent and don't rely on the so-called superheroes like Spider-Man, who actually stand by and in some instances even help criminals take control of the city. Cut to days later, and we're back at the studio where Peter arrives to see the production of filming a scene involving MJ being stuck on a bus with a bomb on it. That sounds familiar. I think it was called the bus that couldn't slow down. In a shocking twist, Spider-Man and Vulture turn up and web the door to the bus, revealing that the bus is primed with an actual bomb that will, well, we'll let the Vulture explain. Explosives are rigged to the bottom of that bus. When the gas tank falls below a quarter of a tank, an electric charge will trigger a detonator wired to the bus's ignition. When it explodes, it will destroy this set and everyone on the bus. So with everyone running for their life except for Peter, who for obvious reasons can't change, it's up to him to solve the puzzle and rescue MJ. After being given full late use of the craft services table, Peter saves MJ by using the classic sugar in the gas tank maneuver. When we return to Peter and MJ's apartment, we're naturally once again bombarded with the same shtick on the TV. Why can't the police catch him? Are they having their annual picnic or what? Is the mayor on vacation? When will this web-slinging wacko be stopped? Well, this is pretty much how the rest of the game progresses, at least up until the end. So before we skip to that, here are some highlights. I'm out of time! Gotta save her! Move it, now! Peter! Get away from the bus! It's gonna blow! Peter! Chip, everyone in Hollywood knows about your kindness and your generosity as much as they know about your film credentials. What's it like being held in such high esteem by your peers? It's very flattering, but I don't consider myself special. And once the streets are safe from this ex-hero, I can turn my attention to the city's economy. I hear they're gearing up for a big celebration when you get back to prison, Daddy. You're going to be the lifer of the party. I just heard from one of the party guests that Daredevil captured Hobgoblin when he attacked Channel 2 Studios. Are you alright, Mr. Mason? Get away from me! Call the police! He tried to kill me! Betray me, and you might be looking at this one day very soon. Why are you back, Spider-Man? Do you plan to kidnap others? Hey, it seems to be working again. So we're finally at the point where it legitimately turns into a multi-path story with multiple different endings. And it all depends on actions you decide on which door to take. Naturally, there is no indication which door leads to what path, so you better save it at this point just in case. So let's break these doors down. No, 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 not literally, or at least not yet. On the left you have Shocker, who reveals that he wants to leave the Sinister Six and promises to help you defeat them in exchange for letting him go. Gee Shocker, I would have expected you to try to quake me by now. Are you taking the day off or what? I'm here to talk business. On the right you have Bob Mason, who reveals that he was a patsy for Dr. Octopus and was promised the mayorship in return for following his orders. Shh, listen, if they hear me, they'll kill me. Listen to me. The whole kidnapping has been faked so that it can depend on you. In both cases, you get the choice of believing them or not. And this is where the endings get utterly bewildering. So let's look at Mason's endings first. If you choose to believe Mason, you push the button Frank, which incapacitates the Sinister Six, and you proceed with Mason to confront Dr. Octopus. You may have defeated the muscle, 
but you haven't beaten the brains behind the Sinister Six. Here, Doc explains his entire plans and reveals to you that Shocker was the one that betrayed him by leaving the note to help you escape his death trap. That traitor! He also explains that Chameleon was impersonating Chip to lure Spidey to the set for them to spring their traps. Which is also why he is such an incredible dick to literally everyone. But why kidnap Alvarez? To draw you in so that I could more easily destroy you! Doc also reveals that being the sole witness to their plan, Chip is currently hooked up to a VR machine that will turn his brain to goop. Because that's exactly how VR works apparently. Mason would testify that you kidnapped and terrorized him. He'll swear under oath that he watched you destroy Alvarez's mind, leaving him nothing but a hollow shell. With the publicity from the story, Bob Mason would be a shoe in to win the election! At this point, you get the classic villain dilemma. So what will it be, Spider-Man? Are you going to fight me, or save Alvarez's life? If you beat up the Doc, you are put into a dodging game and you need to avoid his tentacles for an unspecified time. Remember, Doc, you're just an overweight loudmouth with too many arms and a bad suit. And those are your good points. Which is exactly long enough for Chip to get lobotomized. Dr. Octopus's program has destroyed Alvarez's mind. No! There has to be a way! That's okay because Mason tells you that you did the right thing stopping off. I should have let Dr. Octopus go. If I had, I could have saved Alvarez. And Dr. Octopus could have killed many more innocent people if you hadn't apprehended him. He might have killed my family. You did the right thing. Oh, if I did the right thing, how come it feels so wrong? My decision has cost a man his life. Cut to credits. Or you can do the hero thing and save Chip. I can't free him. He's locked to the V64 unit, and I can't turn the machine off. By entering into the VR. I guess I can expect anything in virtual reality. So that's a thing. You did it, Spider-Man. You saved him. Thank you for saving me from the Sinister Six, Spider-Man. I've always wanted to meet you. I'm a big fan. Anyway, we end up back at the apartment, and Peter is depressed he let Doc Ock get away. I can't believe Dr. Octopus escaped. I shouldn't have let that happen. Well, you had no choice. You had to save Alvarez's life. And you stopped Octopus's scheme. You'll catch up with Doc Ock again. But don't worry, MJ's there to comfort him. You need to focus your attention on something else. Like me. <laughs> Damn, girl. Rewinding back to the previous decision, if we distrust Mason, well, the Sinister Six just ganks you. Uh-oh. Okay, I'll give you one more chance to surrender. Whilst you're recovering from the beatdown, they proceed to use your image to go on a murdering spree. Spider-Man, murderer. That's the shocking story that has stunned New York and the world at large. After a murderous rampage, Spider-Man has taken the lives of movie director Chip Alvarez, mayoral candidate Bob Mason, as well as Mason's wife and two children. Police Chief Moroni has ordered the largest manhunt in New York history. Peter laments about the destruction of his career and the life he was unable to save, talking about how the same bad decision killed Uncle Ben. If only I would have believed Mason and made the right decision, those people would be alive. You did what you thought was right. It wasn't your fault. It's just like Uncle Ben all over again. A bad decision on my part leads to death. Jeez, gang, could you get any darker? End credits. Now if we go back to Shocker, you once again have the two options. If you choose to believe Shocker, he will help you defeat the rest of the six and save Chip. Alright, I'll trust you. But if you're lying, you get an all-expense-paid vacation to the vault. This immediately leads to yet another door choice, but it really doesn't matter this time. One leads to Mysterio, the other Vulture, and both are shooting sections. Don't worry about which one, Shocker will capture the other villain. 
Now this would make a great movie, don't you think? Shocker! Look, I've defeated Vulture. Only Octopus is left. Welcome to the party, Big Bird. How about a glass of punch? I'd make a great golfer. I sank another birdie. Shocker! Look, I defeated Mysterio. Only Octopus is left. You then confront Chameleon, who reveals he was impersonating Chip all along. I'm not Mysterio, but I may just have a future in Hollywood. Before yet another shooting sequence. Well, fall space, time to get you back home to jail. So after all that, you finally confront Dr. Octopus and Mason. Excuse me, is there a doctor in the house? Sorry to break up the victory party, but it looks like your plot to destroy me and take over the world has flopped. Unfortunately, this leads to the exact same choice as before, capture Ock or save Chip. Surely there's got to be an ending where you can do both, right? Well, if you rewind back again and choose to disbelieve Shocker, you attack Shocker and spend the dodge section trying to avoid his blasts. You should have believed me. I'm telling you, you should have believed me. I was telling the truth. After you knock him down and wet him up, he proceeds from the door to find the rest of the Sinister Six captured and in a shock bubble thing. Excuse me, is there a doctor in the house? You guys look a little tied up. Why don't you spill the beans before I take you back to jail? It turns out he was right about utterly betraying the Sinister Six, and you knocked his ass out. Good work, Spidey. Regardless, with Doc Ock and the Six fully subdued, you can proceed to rescue Chip. Thank you for saving me from the Sinister Six, Spider-Man. Lecture Shocker, who apparently got you free from your webs in time to meet you at the end. Without you, I couldn't have done it. If you ever walk one centimeter on the wrong side of the law again, I'll see that you get first-class accommodations at the vault for an extended vacation. I have a full happy ending where the mayor conspiracy is revealed and Chip is back to not being a dick. My hero. Now that Mason is out of the race for mayor, why don't you run? With that thousand-watt smile, you'd be a shoe-in. I'm an actress, Peter, not a politician. <laughs> Sorry, I thought they were one and the same. Speaking of happy endings... You've been working too much. You need to focus your attention on something else. Like me. <laughs> this part of the superhero biz ain't so bad. After all that, let's look at the game itself. And it really is a bit of a mess. Earlier, I called the game a point-to-click adventure. But that's really using the term loosely. Unlike most games in the genre, you have no control over the movement of Spidey in this context. He moves when you click on an interactable object, for example when you need to talk to people, after which he immediately returns to a starting position on the screen. As a fan of the genre, it's almost disappointing just how little there is to do within these parts of the game. Even when you're supposed to be solving logic puzzles, the solutions are handed to you on a platter with no apparent consequence. To make matters worse, you often can't proceed without talking to a certain character first, although this is mostly Mary Jane, which in fairness gives you the context of the scene. Boy, this looks pretty dangerous. I hope Alvarez and Markham know what they're doing. I'm glad I'm not the one up there. But you watch. Jonas Daggert will make it look easy. He's one of the best stuntmen in the business. However, the rest of the interactions get annoying as most of the flavor text just isn't that interesting or adds subplots that just don't pay off. So where did you learn your trade? I'm self-taught. I've been filling my notebook over there with tricks of the trade since I got started. Wow, aren't you afraid someone might steal your secrets? Not really. I code everything, so I'm the only one who could make heads or tails out of my notes. Seeing how most of this is never worked into the puzzles and barely into the plot, it makes you wonder that I'd have bothered working within this genre anyway. This entire game is poorly written from a design perspective. It feels like a jumble of bad minigames strung together with a very thin plot thread. The action parts are utterly atrocious and you're better off avoiding as many as possible. The shooting sequences seem straightforward enough, but even they have a ton of problems. Basically, you aim the red cursor over the object, click the left mouse button and hit the target, except it doesn't really work out that well. You see, the problem is primarily the hit detection. In theory, when your cursor hits the shootable object, it gains a blue ring to signify that you will hit it. The problem is that every single object is moving, so the time between the blue ring appearing, the recognition of it, and the click speed often means that the object has moved before you can hit it. 
The one simple solution is to smash the button as you hover the cursor over the object, but even that doesn't work out most times. Never mind that in most cases the projectiles have absolutely no discernible pathing, so even trying to lead into a shot just doesn't work. Worst still are the dodging sections. Especially if you're restricted to using the worst possible controller for this game type, a mouse. To be fair, this game does have joystick support, but these weren't common peripherals for PCs back in the day. Whilst this might help, I'm not sure it's worth the headache setting one up just for this. Ultimately, this wouldn't be a problem if you could use, say, a standard keyboard that comes with literally every PC to have ever been made. Using the mouse just doesn't work. In fact, more often than not, it refuses to respond, leading to a lot of frustration. Never mind that in the main game itself, the edge detection is utterly pants, with the cursor often looping off the screen and locking off in a weird area on the opposite side. This gets especially aggravating when you need to either hit the menu button or attempt to click off screen to move to another area. To make matters worse, there are several enforced dodging sequences, and as always, these often take long enough for your patience to wear utterly thin. These grievances aside, this isn't that bad a game, I guess. It's mostly just unremarkable beyond the initial novelty. The story is for the most part fine. It's your bog standard dastardly pop that discredits Spider Man and motivates you to defeat them. The voice acting is for the most part okay, if it's a little hammy, but I think that says the dialogue and the overall cartoony nature of the game. You know, you need to get a real hobby, Ock. Did you ever think of collecting stamps? You are my hobby, Spider Man. Speaking of cartoony, this can be roughly considered a 2.5 dimension game. Basically, all the backdrops are 3D built and rendered with traditional 2D animation overlaid on top for all the characters. This makes sense as capabilities to depict humans realistically are just not there at this time, and we wouldn't see a 3D rendered Spidey game for four more years. I think they utilize the 2.5D as a way to make moving background shots easier to animate whilst keeping a cartoony feel, much like the web swinging sections in the 90s series. There are some issues with quality, especially when characters have to be drawn and animated at weird angles and zooms that just don't look right. The pre-rendered backgrounds for the most part aren't that bad, or at least aren't that distracting, but often they just aren't interesting to look at, and sometimes just seem off. For example, the top of this building, the perspective makes the roof look like it's extending from the side of the building. It's one of those cannot be unseen things. This game clearly had some inspiration from the 90s animated series in its design and feel. This is most noticeable in the music created for the game. Although it does feel a little bit bargain based when in comparison. Character and story elements themselves are lifted from the comic books at this time. Most notable is Mary Jane being a famous enough actress, and of course the spider marriage. I pronounce you spider and wife. This isn't surprising as such endeavours like this were really only done to advertise the comics themselves, and nothing more. The only thing left to mention is that the sound tends to go crackly the longer you play it. Who is this director anyway? Not a nice guy, I assume. However, a save, exit, and restore can reset it most of the time, but it is still a persistent issue. Who is this director anyway? Not a nice guy, I assume. The crackling appears to get exasperated at the beginning of cutscenes, so it's often that gets worse when you have a series of them. I'm counting on you, Spider-Man. Hmm, Shocker's powers don't usually work this way. That was a close one. If I hadn't shut off Shocker's device, I would have been picking asphalt out of my suit for weeks. This leads to one of the most puzzling aspects of the game itself. Its accessibility is kind of... weird. It's very common in modern gaming to have a captions option. In this game, there's absolutely zero caption options, which is utterly perplexing for a point-and-click game considering the genre is built on text dialogue. Instead, next to every decision is a speaker button. All this does is make Spider-Man state out loud the option to the right. Should I ask about the director? Should I ask about the movie? Should I ask about the next scene? 
My guess is that they wish this game to be playable by those who might have trouble reading, say, young children and those with dyslexia. If that's the case, then this is somewhat admirable. But to have absolutely no accessibility for those with hearing difficulties, again, weird. Given the recurring audio glitches and zero volume control, this would have been a better option honestly as you can kill the sound and just continue with the text. Finally I want to talk about the one easter egg in the game that I really enjoy, and that is that you get to have a conversation with Janet Van Dyne, aka the Wasp. This must be my lucky evening. Here I am with the two most beautiful women in the room. Easy there, Tiger. Ms. Van Dyne might get the wrong idea about you. Not at all, Mary Jane. That's what I love about these movie parties. Everyone's so relaxed. Most of the parties I go to are full of stuffy wasps. She even manages to throw some shade at Hank Pym, too. If you don't mind my asking your professional opinion, Ms. Van Dyne, I was wondering what you think of Spider-Man. He's not too popular these days. Well, my former husband never thought Spider-Man was serious enough to cut it in the superhero business. But I never knew him to be anything less than fearless. Besides, I bet he's cute underneath those tights. Do you really think he's cute? That's enough, Peter. Let Janet enjoy the party. So it's at this point we have to ask the question, does this do whatever a spider can? Well, we also have to ask ourselves the question, do cutscenes honestly count? To put it simply, there are technically a couple of actions you can do with Spidey that relate to his powers. You clearly have his agility and wall crawling capabilities, as demonstrated in the dodging sections. Although to give credit, there is an actual great use of the Spidey sense. Once. Shocker, seismic blasts are quick. I'll have to rely on my spider sense to warn me of where they'll strike. You also have the usage of his web shooters. And I have to admit that I actually like having animate the hand to follow the cursor. But that's really about it. In the cutscenes, Spidey obviously swings and uses his webbing. And you only really see a bit of Spidey strength when he rips open doors. This game is perhaps unique, and it is one of the very few games where using the spider tracer becomes an actual plot point. Vultures should be around here somewhere. The tracer led me here. Granted, it's a gadget that doesn't get much usage outside of the comics themselves, so it's good to acknowledge a bit of obscure lore when it's used. There really isn't that much to say beyond that. Unless you're a fanatic about these games like I am, I'd say give it a hard pass. In fact, go play Monkey Island, Full Throttle, Space Quest 4, or numerous others if you want great point-to-click experiences. And if you like this video, please click one of the thumbs, comment, and please share and subscribe.